Well, hello class and welcome. Uh, this is lecture number 17 uh, on, the, on the PowerPoint notes. So this is the introduction to, uh, to soils. This is the first of two parts uh, of the soils lecture. So uh, basically, uh, the beginning slide uh, that, that, that appears in, in front of you is the, uh, the, the reason why we study this, and that's agriculture. So agriculture, farming, this is, this is the fundamental um, the fundamental property, or the fundamental reason why soils are so important. If you like to eat food, which most of you probably do, uh, food is generated from the soil. It's, it, plants take out the nutrients, the minerals, the different elements that are in the soil, and we as people have to cultivate, farm the soils, uh, and utilize the soils in order to grow crops and have livestock and so on and so forth. So, so soil is a fundamental process, it's a fundamental part of the Earth's system, and that's what we're gonna be looking at today. So the picture in front of you uh, is a slide of an agricultural area, and after today's lecture, you should be able to talk about the soil's color, its texture, uh, and the different main properties. Now, in next lecture, in lecture 18, we're gonna go through the actual classification system. So today's not classifying, today is just identifying the basic properties of soil and what we go through. So that's what we're gonna talk about. So we're gonna talk about the soil characteristics, the properties of soil, and then how soil forms, and some of the factors that go into formation. Um, all, all of that in today's lecture. The classification system, that fourth bullet point that you see there, that's what we're gonna go through in lecture 18. So the first three bullet points is what we're covering uh, today. So th the most important question to ask is what is soil? As you can see there, it says it's the uppermost layer of Earth's surface. It's made of both mineral uh, and organic matter. So it's both living and non-living material uh, that exists in that soil layer. So mineral components, so calcium, aluminum, things like that, the non-living components that make up our soil. The organic matter, so when plants outside, this is the fall, plants lose their leaves, the leaves fall onto the surface, they decompose, and they break into regular soil particles. So it's a, it's a percentage of organic material, it's also a percentage of inorganic material. Now you might ask, what percentages are they? Well, the organic material, depending on where you are, how many plants you have, uh, and the situation, can be anywhere of 10, 20, 30 percent. It's usually 20 to 30 percent organic material in the top part of the soil. And the rest of it is that, that inorganic mineral components. We talked about rocks breaking down through weathering and erosion. When rocks break up into those small pieces, that's what creates those mineral compounds uh, that we see in that uppermost part of the soil as well. As it says there, it's the transition zone between the atmosphere uh, and, the, and, the, and the earth itself. So there's gonna be a lot of air and water interaction there. It provides plants with physical support, so plants grow into it and out of it. And it also is able to give them the nutrients they need. And the soil, as we've talked about a couple lectures ago, uh, it's able to store a lot of, uh, of water, the groundwater that's there, which then plants are able to tap into when it's not raining outside and utilize that water down the line. Plants, as it says there, uh, support the soil by anchoring them into the soil, so it's kind of a double-edged thing. The, the, the soil is holding or giving place for the plants to grow out of, but the plant roots in turn then hold it in, in its place uh, and not allow it to, to erode away as quickly. Uh, so it's kind of a mutually beneficial relationship, uh, if you will. So the next slide talks about the actual composition of the soil. So as I already mentioned, we have the inorganic and the organic properties. Inorganic material, so natural elements, uh, so silicon, aluminum, iron, potassium, you name it, uh, it's probably in the soil in terms of, of, of inorganic materials. And again, those come from rocks breaking down through the weathering and erosion process into smaller and smaller pieces, and you get the inorganic material that you see in the soil. The organic material, bacteria and fungi, and we're going to talk about this more in detail in lecture number 19, but through their decomposition process, they're able to break down plants and animals that have died off into smaller and smaller components, eventually breaking, breaking them into their mineral components, and that creates the organic material uh, that we see in the top of the soil as well. So again, it's about an 80-20 mix, 70-30, really depends on how much plant life there is, what region of the world we're talking about, uh, and, and we'll get more into that breakdown in a second. All right, so this gives you a very basic graphic of the top soil layer. So what we're talking about is just this uppermost zone of the soil. You can see where the plants are growing out of. Uh, the bedrock is that solid rock area that we talked about way back in lecture um, 12 and 13, we were talking about what stops the moisture. Uh, we're gonna talk about this regolith area in a bit, uh, but that's gonna be your transitional zone where the rocks are actually eroding down and becoming soil is the idea. But for now, we're just focused on this top zone, the soil layer uh, where plants are growing out of, uh, and, and, and that's 
basically what today and, quite frankly, what, what Lecture 18 is all about as well. So what is it called if you study soil? Uh, you are a pedologist because you are studying pedology. Uh, this is the origins, the classification, distribution, and description of the soil types. Uh, as it says, common cliche, but don't judge a book by its cover, uh, it's just that. So you can't just look at the top part of the soil and trying to determine what's there. You have to look at all the different layers from top down uh, in order to fully understand what's going on with the soils. So in order to do that, uh, we, we generate these vertical structures or these vertical profiles of the soil, which we call pedons, which is that third bullet point there. A pedon is just the soil profile from the surface all the way down until you reach that solid bedrock. And basically, you're going to see it has a top layer, several middle layers. It's almost like a piece of layered cake, really. All these different layers stacked up on top of each other, uh, and that gives you this, this pedon. So I can show you actually an example of it. We could skip ahead a few slides. This shows you a nice example of a pedon. It shows you a farmland here. Uh, it shows you uh, this vertical slice, and it blows it up here. And you can see, it's just like I said, it's just like a layered cake. You see all these different layers, and they're all made up of different material. Right? The two we're going to focus on in this class uh, are the O layer near the top and the R layer near the bottom. The O layer, as you might guess, is the organic layer. Uh, this is where all that organic material is. You see the plants, uh, the plant life at the top part of this. When this dies and decomposes, it turns into all this organic material that we see at the top there. And that's why it's called the organic layer, because it has the highest percentage uh, of organic stuff uh, in all of the soil layers. Then the R layer is the very bottom of the soil profile down here. This layer is the rock horizon, as it's called. This is the R layer, uh, and that's uh, where, basically where you reach solid rock and the soil ends. So basically what a pedon is, is it's a vertical slice of the soil from the top all the way down until you reach solid rock. And we pull this up out of the soil, and farmers do this because if you're gonna, draw, you're gonna plant a crop, corn or soybean or tobacco or whatever crop you're trying to plant, when you plant this, these crops are going to pull out all these minerals and nutrients. And what farmers do is they go through their farm and they'll, they'll pull out certain soil samples and they'll try to figure out what crop can grow here the best. Am I going to be able to grow corn really well or what? Uh, and that tells them what crops they should ultimately end up using. So that's what a pedon is. It's the vertical, as it says there, that last bullet point. It's the vertical extent of the soil. Then, on the next slide, it says a polypedon. This is what I was just describing. When a farmer or a group of agriculturalists will come in and they'll take multiple soil samples all around in the area to try to uh, compare one type of soil with another type of soil to try to maximize uh, the, the, the best type of, of chemicals and nutrients that they can find uh, for growing soybean or whatever type of crop they're growing. So polypedons just mean several pedons uh, that they're looking at. So you saw on that pedon, so just to go forward, it's made up of all these horizontal layers, almost like layers of a cake, like I said. Uh, what these are is, as you can imagine, called soil horizons. So these are the horizontal layers that make up the soil profiles. So you have that top O layer, that organic layer, that's where all that organic material is. Beneath that, you have multiple different layers, and then the rock layer down beneath. Now, all those other layers in between, it is super complicated, way beyond the scope of an Earth Science 1101 course. But suffice it to say, there are all these different layers made of all different types of nutrients and minerals, uh, and that's good. those are basically what are called the building blocks uh, of soil. So you can see them all here. Uh, they're labeled A, E, B, C. For this class, we're not going to cover those. That's another class uh, or two down the line if you stay with Earth Science. Uh, but for now, we're just going to focus on uh, the upper and lowermost zones uh, in our pedons, because that's what's most important for us, especially the upper zone uh, when we're farming. So the O-horizon, as we said, the organic layer, top of the soil profile, made up of somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of organic material, really depends on um, the location you're in. If you're in a rainforest or a swampy area, it's going to be more like 30 to 40 percent. If you're in a desert region that really lacks a lot of rain and lacks a lot of plants, it's going to be closer to 5, 10 percent. So it really does vary. Just keep that in mind. But the average is around 20 or so. Then the R horizons, the rock horizon, very bottom of the soil profile. This is what's going to be your solid rock layer that we had talked about in the groundwater lecture. Uh, so that's where we see uh, the base of our soil pedant. So it's the very bottom of the pedon is what we see in that layer. Like I said, all these other layers that you see there, A, E, B, C, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, these are all the different layers that can make up the soil. It's based on sand, silt, clay. It's a sand-silt mix or a clay-silt mix, or it's a mix of all three. Uh, there's all different kind of combinations, literally hundreds of combinations that you can make. 
So it's, it's for a soils class that you would go through something like that. For us, we're just going through the basics, uh, so we'll stick with just the O uh, and the R horizons for now. So the next part of the lecture uh, is on actually identifying the soil properties that we have, and you can see a huge list of them in front of you. Uh, and soil properties range anywhere from color and texture all the way down through that list through chemistry and acidity. So the goal is, over the next few minutes, uh, is to talk about each one of these and try to describe what the word means, how to identify this, and then, then what it means for growing and agriculture uh, and things like that. So you can see the list there. So we're going to break them down one by one. And on the final exam, I am going to want you to be able to identify what each of these are and then fundamentally what they're used for. I'm not going to give you all of the different types of textures and structures and whatnot. But if I say structure, you need to be able to tell me, oh, this is the organization of the soil, something like that. All right, so let's just jump right into it. So soil color uh, was the first one on that list. Color, as it says there, suggests chemical composition and chemical makeup. So it's basically what the soil is made of. So you've all, we all live in Charlotte, right? And, and our soil, when, you, when there's a construction project or something, you see that bright orange color uh, look. Color, when you see that orange soil, it tells you, well, hey, it's probably made of iron, right? Uh, other regions of the world, the soil has a yellowish tint to it. And you'd say, well, it's probably aluminum-based, right? So the different colors in the soil really simply gives you a, an idea of what the chemicals uh, are that make up that soil. Now, scientists started to realize this in the 1800s, and by 1913, they put together what was called the Munsell color chart. It almost looks like if you're going to the paint shop to try to find paint, right? Looks like this, looks like a paint chart. Basically, you take your soil samples, so here's your soil sample, and you look at this and you say, well, what color is this soil? Well, it looks like it's something like this. So you'd say, that's the closest match. So you'd read off on the other side what the most likely chemical composition would be. Uh, and it gives you then a, a rough estimate as to the type of soil you have, at least the type of chemicals that make up the soil. Right now, it's not perfect, but it gives you at least a ballpark picture. Are we dealing aluminum-based, more iron-based, more potassium, whatever chemical is there, kind of gives you a good clue uh, as to what uh, colors are there, right? So that's color. So color yields chemical makeup uh, in the soil. The second, um, uh, the second property of soil is what's called soil texture. As you see there, texture refers to the mixture of the sizes of the soil particles. So many times you think texture, you think, oh, it's how something feels, right? If I rub my hand across the tabletop, oh, it feels a certain way. That's normally what you'd think of in terms of texture. But texture in this case is talking about are my soil particles really, really tiny? Or are they really, really big particles? And the sizes, and I'm sure you've heard these words before, sand, silt, and clay. These are the three main soil particle sizes that we see out there, sand, silt, and clay. So texture describes, do we have all sand, like we're in the sand hills, are we near the beach? Or is it more like Charlotte where it's more clay-based soil? You're describing the texture or how big the particles are. A loam, you can see there on the second bullet point, a loam, it's very common in farming and agriculture. Uh, it's a common distinction which tells you, well, you have a mix of sand, silt, and clay. Now, if you took the Earth Science 1101 lab, you saw a, a picture that looks like this. How you read this is about down in this lower left corner, this is if you had 100% sand, you'd be in this corner. If you had 100% silt, you'd be in this corner. And if you had 100% clay, you'd be in this part of the triangle, which it's very rare to have that, where you have all three uh, as just 100%. What's more likely is you have a little bit of sand, a little bit of clay, and a little bit of silt mixed in, and you're somewhere in the middle of this pyramid, right? So you see a silt loam, a clay loam, a sandy loam, or just a pure loam where it's almost equal amounts of sand, silt, and clay. So that's when you go back to see the, the term loam, as it says, it's a balanced mix of sand, silt, and clay. So when you look at that pyramid, that's exactly what we see here. Sand, clay, and silt. And then a mixture of the three uh, gives you a loam in the middle. Now, we won't go into too much detail on this because, like I said, in the Earth Science 1101 lab, you're given this, and you have to calculate the different um, percentages. But for now, just realize that texture uh, is a measure of that size particle uh, distribution is what we're looking at. All right, so the third one on our list of... Uh, of properties of soil structure. Structure, as you can imagine, it does imply how the soil is arranged. So it's the organization of the soil. So I'm sure you've all planted a plant before in a potted plant or in a garden. Most of us that do that, you've used potting soil. So it's that, that miracle grow, if you will. It's that very loose, crummy, granular soil. 
and you put it in there, it's very loose, you put water in it, water goes right through it, you're describing its structure, right? Structurally, it's just these little tiny particles all grouped together. And the smallest of the soil particles are referred to as a soil ped, which is the second bullet point. So it should say the smallest lump uh, of, of soil particles. So when you get really, really fine, that really loose granular soil, crumbs if you will, uh, that's one way to describe uh, the structure or the organization uh, of the soil. Now I have a couple examples here. This looks like potting soil, this upper slide. This shows you um, the person's hands there. It says like what you'd plant a garden with or a potted plant with. But you can see if it really dries out, notice this center picture, you get almost like blocks of soil. So it, it gets really hardened together in these big blocks. And that's another type of organization. But you can see on the left, the, the textbook images, it can be crumbs, little particles, little plates, blocks, columns. So it's how the soil particles are arranged. And, and that's what uh, soil structure is representing. So structure shows the arrangement or the organization of the soil. All right, so we've done color, texture, and structure. Uh, so what's next? Soil consistence. Consistence, it's kind of an unusual word. Uh, it's also an unusual definition. It describes the cohesion or the stickiness of the soil, right? So how well the soil sticks together. So it's very much related to how much water is in the soil. So if there's a lot of water in the soil, so as it says there, it's a very wet soil, the soil's gonna be really sticky. So if you put your hand in the soil and you lift your hand out, it's all the soil's gonna stick to you, right? When it rains outside and the ground is really, really saturated, it turns into that muddy, very wet soil where it's very, very sticky. The opposite is the last bullet point on there, the dry soil. Dry soil, as it says, is very brittle, very rigid, almost no water in it at all. So if you touch the soil with your hand, right, you lift it up, like we had this summer, very dry summer, you lift your hand up, uh, the, the, the soil doesn't stick to your hand at all because it's not sticky, it's not wet, and that's absolutely dry soil. Most of the time what we have out there though is the middle one, which is moist soil. So it's filled to about half or so capacity of what it can hold. Uh, and so it doesn't really stick all that well, but it's not zero stickiness either. So it's, again, it's describing how well the soil sticks to you and things and itself uh, is soil consistent. So it's the stickiness or the cohesion of the soil is what that one is talking about. All right, so the next uh, soil property is what we refer to as soil porosity. Now, if you remember, we talked about porosity when we dealt with groundwater. We said when water entered the soil, it infiltrated and then percolated its way down. Porosity describes how easily it is for the water to move down through the soil. So if the soil is compact, uh, the type of soil there is, if there are rocks, how, how easily is it for the water to work its way down through there? So as it says there, porosity describes the permeability of the moisture. So how, how easily can it work its way down through those soil layers is what soil porosity is. Porosity um, is affected by all sorts of things. So if you want to make the water go down through the soil more quickly, you can add a tunneling animal, for example, like an ant or an insect that's going to drill down through the soil. And by doing so, when it rains, water can work its way down through those uh, uh, those, 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 those holes that they've dug very easily. So you've increased the porosity of the soil. On the opposite side, like on campus, when you're walking around and people walk off of the sidewalks and they stomp the ground down and you see where the grass is all dead, where they flattened it. When you compact the soil like that, when it rains, water has a very hard time working down through it. So you've decreased the porosity of the soil, right? When we do this on purpose in agriculture is through farming and plowing. When a farmer plows the fields, they churn up the field like this, rips up the soil. And what that does then, and it gives water all these new pathways to work down and, 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 and able to allow water to get into the seeds and the plant roots of the newly uh, planted uh, agricultural crops is what happens. And that's what soil porosity describes. Now with porosity uh, is linked soil moisture, which is the next one. So porosity describes how easily is it for water to move down through the soil. Moisture describes actually how much water there is. So soil moisture is, okay, how much water is in the soil? Uh, and we give it a very specific definition and that is called field capacity. Field capacity is, as it says there, I'll read it and then I'll try to explain it. Uh, it says the maximum water available for plant use after the large spaces have been drained into deep groundwater. So what on earth does that mean? That means if it's raining outside, so imagine it's raining, it hits the ground, and water works its way downward, and some of it works its way into the water table and the groundwater, 
but not all of it does, right? The soil acts like a sponge and the soil is able to hold some of the water up for the plant roots and stuff to use, right? So field capacity is the maximum amount of water the soil is going to able to to hold on its own. Now, some of it will drain down into the groundwater, into the water table, but much of it will just be retained there in the soil. And field capacity is the maximum amount of water that the soil can store. Now, if it drops much below field capacity and the soil starts to really dry out, let's say in a drought, that's when your weaker plants start to, to, to die off, basically. Um, the plant roots can't access it, so they start to fizzle out. And we had talked about this before, right? So that is a little bit about soil moisture. Now, the last soil property, is talking about soil chemistry. Uh, as you can see there, uh, chemistry can be really complicated. We could talk about every chemical that the soil is made of, but that would be way too much, and you could have a whole course on this. So instead, uh, what we're going to focus on in terms of chemistry is the soil's acidity. So most of you should know that the pH scale is a scale of zero uh, to seven for acids, and then seven uh, and beyond for bases. You can see this here. This is the typical pH scale. So less than seven is considered an acid, greater than seven is considered a base. So when soils are out there, right, so soils are out there and it's raining outside, as many of you know, rain contains acidic properties, acid rain. So when it's raining outside, right, all of those acids can acidify the soil. So soil can gain acidity from that, from acid rain. But then, as we said, when plants and animals die off and decay, if you think about a plant, Plants are very acidic, right? When you bite into an orange, you notice that it's a very high level of acidity. So when plants decompose, they also uh, donate a lot of acids to the soil. So the soil has several different ways uh, it can change its acidity. Why is this important? Well, because if you're a farmer and you're trying to plant crops and your acidity is down in this region, six or 5.5, 5, most agricultural crops will not grow if the, if the pH is that low. Uh, so what they have to do is if the pH is, let's say, 5.5, as it says here, you have to add some sort of base to the soil, like lime. So when I was growing up, my father used to always, there was all this moss growing in the, in the, in the yard. He couldn't grow grass because our soil was so acidic. There were so many pine trees around. It just made it super acidic. So in the spring, he would go and spread all this lime all over the place. It would neutralize the soil. It would cause the pH to go back up to about 7. And then grass and other things could grow there. He could garden and things like that. So that that's why farmers do it. So you'll see them spreading this white material all over the fields. It's to neutralize uh, acidic soils in some of these locations. And that's what we see. So that's pH. That's all I want you to know about chemistry uh, for now. So just as a summary, just to go back a whole bunch of slides real quick. Uh, so the soil property slide, just as a recap, color tells you about chemical makeup, texture tells you about the size distribution uh, of the soil, so sand, silt, and clay. Structure tells you about the organization of the soil. Consistence is that stickiness. How well does it stick together? Porosity, the permeability, so how easily can the water move through it? Moisture, talks about how much water there is. Remember, field capacity is the maximum the soil can store. Soil chemistry, acidity, and pH, we're all going to group together uh, and say acidic soils have to be neutralized uh, in order to grow agricultural crops in them. All right, so those are the basic soil properties. That's what I'm going to want you to know for the final exam, uh, just the very basics of those. And when I give you the review sheet uh, prior to the final exam, it will have all of those listed, and you'll have to fill in all of those blanks that we just went through. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me about that. Uh, so soil formation uh, is the next part of this lecture. So that's really what we're going to wrap this up with in the next 10, 15, 20 minutes is talking about how soil forms. So it's natural factors and then what we as people do uh, in order to help create soils in a way, uh, manipulate soils with fertilizer and things like that. Uh, so that's going to be this next part. So what controls uh, the soil type? what's in the soil, that sort of thing. It's both physical and chemical weathering. So if you remember from lecture 16, that was all we talked about was the physical and chemical weathering processes that are in the environment. Uh, remember what weathering is. The physical part of weathering is when rocks physically break down through perhaps frost action uh, or water eroding it, uh, something like that, plants growing in and breaking it apart. Those are all examples of physical types of weathering. Chemical weathering, remember, that's like rusting. So when you get water on a rock, it oxidizes the rock, breaks it 
it apart uh, and it breaks the, the rock that way into the soil particles. So weathering is a huge component. It creates all of the inorganic materials or many of the inorganic materials that are in the soil. Very simple, just rocks that break into smaller and smaller pieces and eventually it forms soils. Right? And that's one of the natural ways uh, we get soil formation. Climate, like everything we've talked about in this class so far, climate has a huge, huge, huge impact on the soil type you're going to have. Whether it is how much rain we get and moisture, uh, how humid it is outside, how much so water evaporates out of the soil, how much rain or snow or ice you get. Does the soil freeze? Is there a glacier? Is it windy or non-windy? All of these things are going to control how much water is in the soil, its structure, what plants can grow there, and thus the organic materials. So climate kind of has a multi-range uh, approach to this. It, it, it affects living, non-living components. It affects all of them. right? So there's a lot of different ways climate can do it. And we're going to talk about some of these climate ways when we actually talk about in lecture 18, the next lecture of the soil types. We'll go through, all right, this soil happens here in the rainforest because it rains all the time. This is the climate effect. So stay tuned for that. We'll get to uh, the climate roles when we actually classify the soil types in lecture number 18. Other natural factors that go into creating soils, we have vegetation, animals, bacteria. So plants, obviously, when they die off, they decompose and become part of the soil. Their root systems grow into the soil and pull out all the water and nutrients. Then plants die off and become the soil. So there's all sorts of ways that it can affect uh, plant life, or the plants affect the soil. Animals and bacteria. Animals, as we said, drill down through the soil. You can have chipmunks and all these different animals, the burrowing animals that go down. It changes the porosity and the structure of the soil. Animals, too, when they die off, they decompose, become part of the soil again. Bacteria and fungi, though, play a very different role. Bacteria and fungi are the decomposers in the environment. What they do is when a plant dies, so let's say leaves fall off of a tree and there's branches on the soil, they don't just sit there. The bacteria and the fungi move in and they break them down into their smaller organic components and eventually they, those organic components are deposited and they become those organic layers that we talked about, that 20 to 30 percent organic layer in the soil. So algae, fungi, bacteria, certain insects help to break down uh, the organic materials and give us those organic parts to the soil is what we see. Right? Another big thing that affects soil type and structure, which you might not think of, is topography. So are we on a mountainside? Is this a valley? What is it? You might say, well, that's kind of weird. Uh, what does topography do? Well, think about it. If you have a mountainside versus a valley, right? So I believe I have a picture here. Uh, here's, a, here's a mountainside versus a flat valley area, area of low relief, meaning very flat, area of high relief, very mountainous. When you do this in cross-section, what do you notice here? Here's the soil that's on the steep slope. Here's the soil that's on the flat slope. The, the orange represents the soil. So what you notice, what you should notice, is where it's really flat like this, it's much deeper. Right? Because from last lecture, remember what happens on these slopes? As it rains, water will run across this very quickly because it's steep, so it erodes that top layer off very easily. And when it erodes this off, where does it carry it? It carries it downhill, and then it deposits it in this area. So you get these big deposits of soil in these areas, but it removes all the soil there. And that has a huge implication when you're talking about uh, planting. Right? If you're trying to plant crops on the hillside, the soil is going to be super thin, versus in the valleys, the soil is much deeper, so you have a lot more minerals and nutrients, a lot more room to work with, a lot more room to farm and, and plow and for the roots to access. So topography really will control the depth of the soil, and that's very, very important to realize. Then, of course, um, the one main thing uh, that you might not have thought of either uh, is time. Soil takes a long time to develop, right? So a, a, a few inches of prime farmable soil takes hundreds of years to form. So when you're talking on just a few inches of soil, it's not like it forms overnight or in a couple weeks or a few months. We're talking about hundreds, if not thousands of years uh, to develop, right? So as it says, some of these uh, areas, these floodplains uh, uh, and areas in parts of Europe and Asia have soils that can be dated back tens of thousands of years old, uh, is the idea. Uh, so as it says there on this side, a few centimeters of prime farmable soil takes roughly half a, half a millennia to form, like 500 years or so, centuries uh, in order to form. So if it takes that long to form, how do we have so much agriculture everywhere? The answer to that is these next couple bullet points. So we plow fields. So what happens is all that organic material is concentrated near the top. 
So we come through with a plow and we churn it all up and we send all that organic material and we mix it all through the layers. So now all those organic materials or all of that uh, very fertile material is mixed all the way down so the roots can access it. So that's why we plow. It also allows water to trickle down through the soil uh, and the plant roots can access it that way. Right? The, the consequence of this though is the third bullet point and that's flooding. Anytime you plow a field, you break up the current roots that are in there, you loosen the soil and if you get heavy, heavy rainfall, this can cause uh, all of this stuff to start sliding downhill and cause a, a major erosion and flooding potential. So those are both, as it says, they're enhanced by people whenever we plow fields. You can create more erosion and flooding that would have been there otherwise. Right? That's one thing. The other thing is when we, when we plant crops, right? let's say you're a tobacco farmer and you plant tobacco in your field, you harvest the tobacco. Next year you plant more tobacco, then you cut the tobacco, and the next year you plant more tobacco. What that plant is doing is it drains the nutrients out of the soil, then you're removing them because you harvest it. Then you plant new ones and it drains more of that material out and then you remove it. That really damages the soil because you just keep taking the same nutrients out over and over and over again. So a way to combat this is through crop rotation. So what we do is we'll plant corn one year, the corn might take all the iron out. Then we'll plant soybean one year, and that'll take all the potassium out. And that gives time for the other elements to return back to the soil. That's one thing we can do. The other thing we can do, you might guess, uh, is fertilize. We can go through and with big tanker trucks and whatever, uh, aircraft, and you can spray the, the soil with all these nutrients that it's missing. Right? So we can measure the soil and say, okay, we're lacking this amount of, uh, of this nutrient. So we can just go through, the farmers can decide which, which types of nutrients the plants have used up, and then just go add those to the soil uh, via fertilization. So they can just go through and fertilize the soil manually uh, is another way of doing it. So when you look at this graphic, it shows you a map of what's called soil degradation. Uh, what soil degradation is, is areas of soil on Earth's surface that have been damaged by agriculture, meaning the plants keep growing over and over again and keep removing those same minerals out of the soil. So what you can see on here, the areas that are in the darkest colors, the heartland of America, so where we have our, most of our agriculture through the Midwest and central states. You can see a lot of Europe and parts of Asia, parts of China, uh, parts of Africa. Now this doesn't mean, now don't confuse it, this doesn't mean uh, that you cannot farm here. What this means is the soil has been degraded, meaning in order to farm here, we have to fertilize, we have to crop rotate, we have to do those things we just talked about in order to sustain agriculture in those regions. So it's a big, big issue uh, when it comes to farming and agriculture, knowing what is there, knowing what's missing, and knowing what plants uh, are going to be removing. So degradation is a big problem that agriculturalists and farmers have to face all the time uh, in order to figure this out. All right. So the last part of today's lecture is to talk very briefly about the soil classification system. All of lecture 18, which we'll go through next, uh, is on soil classification, but today I thought I'd introduce what it actually is. So soil classification, what it's called, is soil taxonomy. Right? The word taxonomy means to classify the soil types. Soil classification uh, is a relatively new concept. So as it says, it was first developed in the mid-1970s, so this isn't that old. Uh, and then it was revised in the late 1990s. 70s, in the 1970s, they came up with some basic soil types, and then through more research and more exploration, we developed several new soil types, which we'll go through again in lecture 18. And these were updated in 1999, especially in areas in the far northern regions, northern Canada, near the North Pole, where we didn't explore too much prior to 1975. So we didn't have a lot of data there to classify those really cold, frozen soils of the far north. Right, so what this system does as it says, soil taxonomy, it's a classification system. It breaks the soils into, as it says, there are six different subcategories. So if you've taken a life science class, whether it was in middle school or high school or wherever, uh, you might have, might have learned the animal and plant kingdoms, right? Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. The plant and animal kingdoms were the big, broad areas uh, that you learned about. You all the plants and all the animals, super, super vague, very, very broad. You worked your way all the way down to the plant species, and the species was the specific, very, very specific, and there are millions and millions of spe uh, species types uh, on Earth. This is super analogous to what this is. Soil taxonomy is the classification system. Series all the way to orders. Orders are like the animal and plant kingdoms. They're very big, they're very broad, they're very generic, they're very vague. 
but they give us an overview of the soil types that we have. Whereas a series is analogous to the species. It's super specific. So you could go outside of your house or outside on campus and you would see there could be individual series all over the place. There could be a dozen or more soil series types uh, on campus, but they would probably all be in one order. So orders are very broad, over, overreaching uh, kind of categories, whereas series are very specific, uh, very, very, very honed in, uh, very much like the species of the plants and animals, right? So uh, basically the next slide is gonna show you that there are 12 soil orders, so the world can be broken into 12 primary soil types. Uh, and we're going to talk about in lecture 18 what causes the soils to be different, the variations, the color, the texture, all of the classifications and properties that we talked about today we're going to go through uh, as we go through this. But for now, I just want to give you an overview of the 12 and see if we can make a couple quick uh, assessments before we jump into lecture number 18. So this graphic here shows you soil taxonomy. Right? You can see it's all colored uh, all over the map. Uh, and you can see on the left, it shows you the 12 basic soil types here, right? From the oranges and this region to the greens and yellows, all these different colors represent a different soil type. So you can see the map. They're pretty well distributed. They're all over the world. And you might say, well, how are they distributed? Uh, and the first thing to think back to uh, is climate. If you think all the way back when we dealt with climate in lectures 9, 10, 11, remember I said, oh, so many things on earth are controlled by the climate. We always hear about climate change, why it's so important. Uh, here it is once again, climate playing a role. If you look at here where we are in North Carolina in the southeast, right, we're in this yellow climate regime, which if you read over there, it's called an ultisol. Again, we'll get through this in lecture 18. But where do we also see these in the world? It's over here in Southeastern Asia, parts of China and other areas of Southeastern Asia. What is also the same in those regions? The climate. The climate of the Southeastern US is very similar to the climate of these regions in Southeastern Asia. If you look in the Northern tier states, so Northern Michigan, uh, Northern New England, Maine, and to Southern Canada, this is a very cold uh, microthermal climate zone. That's the same thing as where Moscow is and parts of Eastern and Central Russia. These are the tundra areas up here in Alaska. These are the same tundra areas up here in, in, in Russia. So hopefully you can see the connection. Where there are climate zones, the climate controls the plants that grow there, the animals that live there, how much rain you get, so the porosity and the soil moisture and all of that. So the climate is going to be the number one thing that controls where these soils are distributed uh, on Earth. So when you look at that map, you should be able to make very key distinctions. Look at the desert regions. The deserts are these orange areas. You see the Sahara, there's the Middle East. You see parts of the uh, desert regions of China and Mongolia, uh, parts of Australia. So they're all linked together based on the climate zones. And that's what we're going to talk about in lecture number 18. So that's going to be our goal. In lecture 18, we're going to break down these 12 soil orders into their subcomponents. I'm going to give you examples of where they're formed, uh, how they develop, the types of agriculture you can expect to see in those areas, uh, and just a few other bits and pieces based on the cl classification system known as soil taxonomy. All right, well, that wraps up lecture number 17. I will see you all back for lecture number 18. Have a good day.